So the focus on teaching and learning to me is vital. Now, what we know about learners is, about children is, that children are learning organisms. Uh, children don't need to be helped to learn, for the most part. They, they are born with a vast, voracious appetite for learning. In fact, they evolve in the womb with a great voracious appetite for learning. There's a lot of evidence now <clears throat> that beyond a certain point, children are absorbing all kinds of things from their mother uh, while they're in utero. You know, they're, they're picking up voice rhythms. They're actually developing tastes uh, for certain types of nutrient. Uh, it's why kids come out listening to the cadences of language. Now, what we also know is you don't <coughs> teach your child to speak. Most kids get to learn to speak, you know, in the first year and a half or so of their life. Um, but you don't teach them, do you? If you've got kids, you know that. You don't sit them down, you know, when they get to the age of one and say, OK, here's the situation. <laughs> you know, you probably notice your mother and I keep making all these noises. <laughs> and they actually refer to things that are in the, in the room here. All these things have names, as we call them. And here's a list of them. <laughs> now, there are roughly 50,000 to get through in the next couple of months. And when we've got all those down, we'll start to introduce verbs which can tell you what you can do with these things. And later on, things you might have done with them in certain circumstances and things <laughs> you could have done possibly in the past, or at least the hypothetical past. Of course, you can't do that. They just pick it up. I mean, you nudge them, you correct them, you encourage them, you don't teach them to speak. We do teach them to write. That's a different thing. Writing appeared much later in human evolution than speech. I mean, very recently, actually, we've had a history of written systems. But my point is that children have a vast appetite for learning. And it only starts to dissipate when we educate them. That's to say, when we put them in buildings designed for the purpose and put them in serried ranks and start to force feed them information in which they may or may not have an interest. Now, the conceit of education is that you know, children learn anyway. The conceit of education is that we can help them do it better and direct them to things they may not otherwise learn if left to their own devices. That's why we plan to do this sort of stuff. But learning will happen anyway, and with the new technologies happening more and more, actually, spontaneously. What it means is, if we really want education to be effective, we have to focus on the process of teaching and learning. And teaching, I think, over the course of the past number of years, uh, of our, these so-called reform movements, has become reduced in the political discourse to a kind of delivery system. You know, your job is to deliver the national curriculum. I don't know when we borrowed all this lexicon from FedEx. I don't know when that began to happen, that we dropped the curriculum off for you. Um, but teaching has become seen as kind of delivery system, and teachers have become seen as kind of functionaries in the raising of standards and the administration of tests. Actually, actually, teaching is an art form. Everything I've ever learned and seen about teaching convinces me that is the case. It's not enough to be a good teacher to know your stuff, though you need to know it. You don't need to know everything, but you need to know enough to be able to teach it. But more than that, you need to be able to excite people about the material. You need to engage them. You need to pique their imaginations. You need to fuel their creativity. You need to uh, drive their passion for it. You need to get them to want to learn this. You need to find points of entry. That's the gift of a great teacher. Attention deficit disorder increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> they can hardly think straight in Arkansas. And by the time they get to Washington, they've lost it completely. And there are separate reasons for that, I believe. <laughs> it's a fictitious epidemic. If you think of it, the arts... And I don't say this exclusively of the arts. I think it's also true of science and of maths. But let me, I say about the arts particularly because they are the victims of this mentality currently, particularly. The arts especially address the idea of aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at their peak. When you're present in the current moment when you're resonating with the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing, when you are fully alive. And anesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children through education by anesthetizing them. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up. 
to what they have inside of themselves. I want to talk today only about autonomy. In, 21st, in 20th century, we came up with this idea of management. Management did not emanate from nature. Okay? Management is an, it's, it's, like, it's not a tree, it's a television set. Okay? Somebody invented it, and it doesn't mean it's going to work forever. Management is great. Traditional notions of management are great if you want compliance. But if you want engagement, self-direction works better. Let me give you some examples of some kind of radical notions of, of self-direction. Um, and what this means, you, see, you, see, you don't see a lot of it, but you see the first stirrings of something really interesting going on. Because what it means is it means paying people adequately and fairly, absolutely. Getting the issue of money off the table and then giving people lots of autonomy. Let me give you some examples. How many of you have heard of the company Atlassian? Okay, it looks like less than half. Um, <laughs> Atlassian is an Australian software company, and they do something incredibly cool. A few times a year, they tell their engineers, go for the next 24 hours and work on anything you want. As long as it's not part of your regular job, work on anything you want. So the engineers use this time to come up with a cool uh, patch of code, to come up with an elegant hack, then they present all of these stuff that they've developed to their uh, teammates, to the rest of the company, in this wild and woolly all-hands meeting at the end of the day. And then, being Australians, everybody has a beer. They call them FedEx days. Why? Because you have to deliver something overnight. <laughs> it's pretty, it's not bad. It's a, it's a huge trademark violation, but it's pretty clever. Um, <laughs> that one day of intense autonomy has produced a whole array of software fixes that might never have existed. And it's worked so well that Atlassian has taken it to the next level with 20% time, done famously at Google, where engineers can work, spend 20% of their time working on anything they want. They have autonomy over their time, their task, their team, their technique. Okay, radical amounts of autonomy. And at Google, as, most of, as many of you know, about half of the new products in a typical year are birthed during that 20% time. Things like Gmail, Orkut, Google News. Let me give you an even more radical example of it. Something called the results only work environment, the row created by two American consultants in place at about a dozen companies around North America. In a row, people don't have schedules. They show up when they want. They don't have to be in the office at a certain time or any time. They just have to get their work done. How they do it, when they do it, where they do it, is totally up to them. Meetings in these kinds of environments are optional. What happens? Almost across the board. Productivity goes up, worker engagement goes up, uh, worker satisfaction goes up, turnover goes down. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. These are the building blocks of a new way of doing things. Now, some of you might look at this and say, hmm, that sounds nice, but it's utopian. And I say, nope, I have proof. In the mid-1990s, Microsoft started an encyclopedia called Encarta. They had deployed all the right incentives, all the right incentives. They paid professionals to write and edit thousands of articles. Well-compensated managers oversaw the whole thing to make sure it came in on budget and on time. A few years later, another encyclopedia got started. Different model, right? Do it for fun. No one gets paid a cent or a euro or a yen. Do it because you like to do it. Now, if you had, just 10 years ago, if you had gone to an economist anywhere, and said, hey, I got these two different models for creating an encyclopedia. If they went head-to-head, -head, who would win? Ten years ago, you could not have found a single sober economist anywhere on planet Earth <laughs> who would have predicted the Wikipedia model. This is the titanic battle between these two approaches. This is the Ali Frazier of motivation, right? This is the thrilla in Manila, all right? Intrinsic motivators versus extrinsic motivators. Uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose versus carrots and sticks, and who wins? Intrinsic motivation, autonomy, mastery, and purpose in a knockout. So I had this idea of showing you how to make a really simple device for using your phone or something like that to record yourself doing a demonstration video, and I found this box.
This thing is full of all kinds of old lessons and stuff like that and dust and whatever else and has been used. Look at this. Look at this dust hanging on here. Hair and whatever else. But the point is it hasn't been used in for forever. Whoa. Upside down man stuff. There's some copies that we could probably use. Either way, I'm going to take all these out and I'm going to put them in somewhere to be sorted and probably eventually recycled. Because all I want is the box. Okay, so mind you, I'm doing this with my phone, and almost got my box empty. Stuck. Been in there a while without being touched. So now I've got this box. It happens to have one side open, and look at that. There's a hole in the top. I could already, you could see I could just stick my hand in there. Nope. Wasn't quite ready for my phone yet. Kind of like that on the side, stick my hand in there and I could draw. Light's not very good, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up the sides a little bit. I've just flipped it on its side, got some scissors, and I'm going to cut, because this is hard to hold and do at the same time. I'm going to cut this and then come back. So I've removed, I have removed another side, it's two sides gone. I'm going to cut a hole out of this side and then this side. And there we go. Okay, so now I've got chunks taken out all four sides. A little bit more light in there. A little bit. I can put my phone right there. I can reach my hand inside. And I can do my drawing demonstration. Could put a light in the side if I want to. But basically I've got my phone halfway on the box. And halfway in the hole. I can come in here and I can do my drawing. All my scissors. Simple enough. The bigger the holes you make on the sides, the more light obviously will get let into your stage on the bottom and you should be able to do a pretty rudimentary thing. It's kind of like uh, making your own Elmo. Here's the box in a simple setup with a shop light I found. Uh, so Beth can make the video that you saw earlier in the presentation. So basically, what happens is, information enters 